Welcome to the Raise with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where the life of Jesus meets yours. You've got your daily Bible reading today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So when we could not stand it any longer, we thought it best to remain behind in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God and the gospel of Christ. We sent him to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one will be shaken by these trials, for you know well that we are destined for this. In fact, even when we were with you, we told you ahead of time that we were going to suffer, and it happened just that way as you know. This is why, when I could not stand it any longer, I sent to find out about your faith, because I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might have been for nothing. But now Timothy has returned to us from you, and and has told us the good news about your faith and love. He also told us that you always have fond memories of us and long to see us, just as much as we also long to see you. Because of this, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For now we really live, if you are standing firm in the Lord. Indeed, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have before God on account of you? Night and day we are praying earnestly to see you in person and to supply what is lacking in your faith. May God our Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord increase your love and make it overflow for each other and for all people, just as ours does for you, so that he may establish your hearts as blameless in holiness before our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his saints. This is the word of our God. The line of thought here in First Thessalonians, thus far in chapters 1 and 2, uh, chapter 1. Paul had expressed such joy, such thankfulness. We thank God for you, you imitators of Christ and model Christians. And then chapter 2, Paul very gently but authoritatively reminds them when he says, basically, you remember how when I was with you, I loved you, I served you as a father, as, as a mother with her children. You remember that, don't you? And And what he was kind of doing there in chapter 2 was also dispelling the notion that he was just some teacher for hire, just some traveling guru, um, like appeared to be common in the Greek society, somebody going from place to place, um, peddling their teaching for profit. And that accusation might have been there and was possibly there because Paul had Paul had been teaching. And then when there was some opposition, he got out of town. And that's what Paul had kind of reminded them of in chapters 1 and 2. He was reminding them of how he had acted among them, how he had acted with integrity. There was no sense of any greed or flattery. He had even worked hard so as to support himself and not be a burden to them. And that that fact helped to support the reality that he was not in this for personal gain, but in this for... Um, for the joy of sharing Jesus with them. And then beginning back in verse 17 of chapter 2, we heard more about Paul's desire to to visit the Thessalonians again. Then we get into chapter 3, and realistically, chapter 3 really could have or maybe should have started just a verse or two earlier, um, verse 17 of chapter 2, at least least as far as the thought goes, and that's a more logical break in the outline. Um, Beginning in chapter 2, verse 17, As for us, brothers, after we were separated from you like orphans for just a short time, in person, not with heart, it was with great desire that we made every effort to see you again in person, for we wanted to come to you, um, but Satan hindered us. Indeed, who is our hope or joy or crown about which we boast before our Lord Jesus when he returns? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. And that provides, um, I guess, enough of an intro for what we're talking about here in in First Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul kind of moves fairly quickly through the first few verses um, because he's just repeating what he what they already know, that Paul has sent Timothy back to them. But there's a reminder even there in that first paragraph, um, such as verse, verse 3 and 4, um, verse 2, 3, and 4, I guess. We sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one will be shaken by these trials, for you know well that we are destined for this. In fact, even when we were with you, we told you ahead of time that we were going to suffer, and it happened just that way, as you know. And there's the kind of the reminder there for Christians that that the Christian life isn't this side of heaven always going to be roses and daisies. And 
that in reality, God may even allow and in his goodness may even send things that we perceive to be bad. But there's a difference between something that is morally evil and something that we perceive to be bad or unpleasant. And in this case, there is moral evil, yes, perpetrated against the Thessalonians because, because the preaching of the gospel was hindered in their midst. And that is always a bad thing. That is always a sinful thing. But God would use it so that it wouldn't be a a bad thing for them. God would use it for their eternal good. Just as Paul writes in, you know, Romans chapter 8 verse 28, um and a lot of that Romans at chapter 8 passage was part of our part of our second reading this past Sunday. As we think about this reality that God says that we are destined for suffering. God says that he will use that suffering for our good and that we should not try to discern the goodness or badness of an event based on our perception of it, but rather we should discern the goodness or badness of an event based on the outcome and leave that outcome in his hands. And so looking at the three paragraphs of chapter three, you might notice that basically paragraph one, if you're following along in a, in a paper Bible or on your phone or something like that, chapter one is basically an audible sigh of relief as Paul is like, finally, we have good news from you. This is fantastic. And then the second paragraph, Paul expresses his own desire to go see the Thessalonians, but note that the that thread of relationship and mutual encouragement is woven throughout this entire chapter. Paul talks about, you know, verse 6, he says that the Thessalonians always have fond memories of us and long to see us just as much as we also long to see you. Um, because of this, verse 7, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. Verse 8, for now we really live um, if you are standing firm in the Lord. We've got a new lease on life. <laughs> and just that brief window into Paul's pastoral heart, he has this love, this care for this people, um, this love that is, yes, founded upon the work of Jesus for him and the Jesus that he gets to share with them, but it's not some detached and cold um, analysis, some sort of calculated actuarial analysis or something like that, but it's this relationship that rejoices to see the gospel overcome the attempts of Satan to destroy the church. That <laughs> That's something that he even talked about back in chapter two as well. We had been fearful, um, and at the beginning of chapter three here, we had been fearful that somehow the tempter had tempted to do and our labor might have been for nothing, but he rejoices that the victory of Jesus still continues to be their victory as well, that Jesus has exercised his victory in their life, and, and they can see in their own lives that Satan has been pushed back, that Satan doesn't have the final word, that they are standing firm, and that is an encouragement for Paul. Paul rejoices, not just that, and it's not in some sort of, you know, making a name for himself kind of a way. But Paul rejoices with this, um, I guess the word is maybe authentic or wholehearted joy because the gospel has had fruit. The gospel has borne some fruit and they are standing firm in the Lord and Satan has been pushed back and he, and his, his work and his sacrifice was not in vain. And even though, even though he can't be in Thessalonica right now, at the same time, he is rejoicing because they are standing firm. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have before God on account of you? I don't know if it's very often that your pastor talks that way in a sermon. Um, I think it comes up for me every now and then. You know, we talked about it back at the beginning of January as as we were looking back and thinking about the year 2020 and, and how it was just a different year for all of us. But what really came to mind to me, and you could probably see this in your own congregation and in your own life, is the joy that Jesus has accomplished his work again and that that God's people here at this place or here and there at your congregation. And so Paul wraps up with this desire to see them in a, yes, in a heartfelt way. And he concludes this chapter the same way that he did the previous chapter, at least the previous line of thought, that he looks ahead to 
verse 13. So may God establish your hearts as blameless in holiness before our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his saints. It's possible that Paul had recognized the coming of the Lord Jesus as as one of the potential you know difficult doctrines for his congregation, and each congregation is a little bit different. Um, and he concluded he's mentioned that coming of the Lord Jesus at the end of time a couple of times already, but he's going to get into that a little bit more detail a little bit further into First Thessalonians here in the next chapter, I believe. And so what do we learn from this? Um, obviously, we see the, the love and compassion among a Christian congregation, between Christian congregation and their pastor. We see the fact that suffering in our life, um, even though it may be unpleasant, it is not necessarily morally evil. And even if it is a moral evil that has been carried out, um, God still promises and is, is still able to use that evil for our eternal good and for our good. And above all, it teaches us to rely upon him even when things don't seem to be going our way. And then finally, there's this joy that the gospel continues to be the victory parade of Jesus through this world. The gospel continues to tear down the throne and the stronghold and the kingdom of the devil. And the gospel continues to have its success. And that success is the preaching of Jesus, the salvation of souls, building a church that will stand even against the the gates of hell. And so as you go about your day, Just take a moment to give thanks to God for that pastor, that Christian friend, that person who kind of embodies those things for you, that person who pointed you to Jesus or who really, really demonstrated what it meant to be a Christian, who really taught you something that set your heart and your mind at ease, who really helped there and was there for you during the, you know, what may have been a long struggle in overcoming a particular sin or overcoming a particular temptation to um, to guilt or shame or something like that, so that the victory of Jesus and the joy of Jesus may be brought home to you. Thanks so much for joining us here at the Raised with Jesus podcast. Be sure to check out our other episode today. Uh, that's Pastor Mike Zarling's sermon from this past Sunday talking about reasons to hate Jesus. He resisted temptation. God bless your day.